the suspect, we are told, got out of his car, jumped off of the bridge and into the Rio Grande River, and then swam into Mexico. I don't know how far of a drop that is. Clearly a very good drop. This man did not want to be caught. Swam into Mexico. We understand Mexican authorities did also come very close to the border of the bridge as well and have been involved in the search for this suspect on the Mexican side of the border. This again still a developing story. We are trying to piece together some of the basic facts on this in terms of exactly what precipitated this chase that way. Let me show you something. This has been part of the problem out here. This sandy terrain. We're going to go now to the video that we shot earlier in the day. You're going to see the smoke. Sheriff's deputies still establishing a one mile perimeter again north of FM 2812 between Valverde and Uresti. Helicopter still searching out there and flashing the spotlights into the brush. So again, if you live in this area, you can either expect sheriff's deputies to come out and do a canvas, and otherwise I would be very, very cautious about answering your door or letting one, anyone come to the door unless you can confirm who they are. Dry piece of wood may not look like much, but this afternoon it turned into a lifeline. Sill says this is what he grabbed and thrust into the water so that the first girl could grab hold. We've got a pretty good start going here, but we really have a long ways to go. This is a big, big truck. You can hear my voice echoing all the way to the back here. We need to fill this thing up by the end of this week. Let me show you some of the stuff that folks have been bringing by so far today. Nothing really special, just the everyday items. Notepads, glue sticks, pens, and number two pencils. Just the basic necessities, won't cost a lot of money. Cheap little items, all these kids need. One thing we couldn't help but notice is this large pile of debris these workers have been leaving on the side of the road here for the last several hours. Clearly this is a bit of a hazard. If this gets picked up by some wind, it's going to be a pretty dangerous projectile sent down the street. The workers here are telling us that they're hoping a city crew comes by and picks this all up. This march looks like it's going to finish peacefully, but before it started, some of these people were talking about an armed white revolution. Debris strewn all over the road, as you can see, you can't even tell what it some of this used to be apparently a car battery there. As of 3 o'clock in the afternoon, we're now feeling like sustained winds of more than 80 miles an hour. The closest point of approach to Typhoon Roy has been changed to just 12 miles north of the island. It's now set for 7.30 in the evening. In world news, a strong earthquake rocked Taiwan today, killing at least three people and flattening homes. Putin believes that hazardous fumes must have been sucked inside the building's ventilation system from the outside. This is the Eagle River substation where they have a public counter. What we're going to do is walk around to the public counter and see what happens when someone in Eagle River wants to come here in person and maybe report a crime. Well, we can see that the door is locked and we have to press this buzzer to maybe get some service. I don't know how long it would take. We did see a patrol car coming in and out. But even after this property gets cleaned up or even torn down, the scars of the crime that was committed here will remain. More than two years after an arson fire killed two people inside this home, the case remains unsolved and investigators say it's going nowhere. This is what you see at the front gate of a 200 acre ranch north of Rio Grande City. The U.S. Attorney's Office says the property is owned by this man, Carlos Alberto Oliva Castillo. Mexican federal authorities have named him the number three man in the Zetas drug cartel. He is accused in the August casino massacre in Monterey. 52 people died at the Casino Royale. The U.S. Attorney's Office claims Oliva used this property to facilitate drug activities. They say he is responsible for organizing networks of individuals who drive vehicles loaded with cocaine. Federal documents only list a legal description of the property, so we came here to the Starr County Appraisal District Office for answers. U.S. authorities named the owner of the property as Carlos Ricardo Tamez Tirado. He's a doctor from the Mexican town of Diaz Ordaz. The government says Tirado was a straw purchaser, a front man for Oliva. Star County Chief Appraiser Humberto Sainz Jr. says the property has changed ownership several times since 2003 before Tirado bought it in 2007. Uh, Miguel de los Santos, his wife, and uh, Jose Loy Pulido, his wife, there's a warranty deed with Vendors Lane where they sold to Carlos uh, Ricardo Tamez Tirado. Yeah. 
The federal government claims the actual price for the property was $400,000, not the listed price of $125,000. The Star County Appraiser's Office pulled the property up for us on a map, then showed us images on a computer. Yeah, let's go ahead and zoom in and see the properties there, the buildings. There's a pretty good sized building there, several outbuildings. And then you mentioned there was an antenna. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at that. That's a pretty good sized communication tower. From the road, the communications tower is clearly visible. We can hear some voices in the distance, but one of the first things you notice about being out here is it's totally quiet. You'd never know anything out of the ordinary was going on out here, but prosecutors say it was behind these gates that Oliva would receive the money from his drug transactions. The U.S. Attorney's Office says Oliva paid for the ranch entirely with drug proceeds. A pre-dawn briefing. He also has a history of evading and resisting. U.S. Marshals. It's a small little neighborhood. On the hunt for suspects. As long as we got rear cover, guys, we're good to go. This task force has two recent murder arrests under its belt. They recently brought in Leonardo Alonso Blanco on a warrant relating to a 1993 murder in Mission. Also, Adolfo Rocio, convicted in the shooting death of Martin Arturo Garza in 1992. First stop today, Palm View, a suspect, not home. We involve everybody, every local agency, every federal agency. Next stop, San Juan, a suspect with gang ties and a history of assault. We never know what to expect on the inside. Another miss. Guy wasn't there, it's bogus address, false address, and now we just go and do our, our legwork now. Now, Mercedes, the search for a cocaine suspect. A third strike. In the long run, you know, we're going to end up getting these guys. The task force is patient. Some more investigation. They'll be back out again tomorrow. In Hidalgo County, Kirk Chase on Channel 5 News at 6. Fort Mansfield. Scenic. Natural. Fisherman's Paradise. Wide open. Miles of seemingly unprotected waters and shoreline. Beneath the beauty for some in law enforcement, a growing anxiety exists that the battle for the border is creeping toward this town. It seems like the, the focus is shifting back to this side for right now. First in the dusty brushlands that surround the port. A local rancher out east that uh, come across some people backpacking through his, his property and uh, basically kind of stood up to him, you know, uh, what are you doing here? Uh, this is my property, you need to leave, and like, what are you going to do if I don't? Willisee County Sheriff Larry Spence's concerns reach past the ranch lands, past the shoreline, here to the intracoastal waterway. What's not going up the highway is going up the waterway. The deputies patrol in the one boat the department owns. This is a main roadway. The intercoastal canal comes all the way from Brownsville and South Padre Island all the way through and cuts through the state of Texas uh, all the way up to Louisiana. Sergeant J.M. Gonzalez and Deputy Jesse Castaneda have covered this area for eight months. They know they could come across drug or human smugglers. There are some that become very agitated or very scared as you approach them. And those are the ones that you want to key in on. And uh, by their actions, you know that something might be up. People in this tiny town are a little bit nervous when it comes to talking about drugs and contraband. But the owner of one business tells me it's very clear. People are definitely using this waterway as an avenue, as a highway to move drugs from Mexico north. The question is just who is doing it and when. Most people here seem to feel they're separated from the criminal activity that has invaded much of the valley. Some tell me undercover ICE agents routinely visit, watching for anything unusual. Jan Jones owns a local pub. She says the waters off the town's shores are vulnerable. You've got from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. before anybody around here, you know, is really out and about. 
Back on the water, the deputies patrol at various times of the day, making it harder for potential smugglers to avoid them. We, of course, have those who come out here to conduct other business and do other things that they're not supposed to. It's risky duty. Backup is harder to call in than on the streets of a city or town. We were interviewing some people and they became very belligerent knowing that it's uh, a long distance to take them back into jail uh, and that we're out here by ourselves and it's, it becomes a one-to-one -one situation. A one-to-one -one situation. The deputies prepared. We went and acquired some extra heavy-duty weapons, more heavy-duty artillery type to speak. The waters off Port Mansfield may seem open, but... Not unprotected because we're out here out here, vigilant, in this corner of the battle for the border. In Port Mansfield, Kirk Chason, Channel 5 News at 1030.